Hey everybody, it's Chris, the host of Is It Just Speculation, the podcast where we take a look at the gray areas of life, where things are not always black and white or as they seem to be. We cover a lot of different topics with a lot of different people, and so if you like this episode, feel free to check out the other ones, and make sure you follow the podcast for the latest upcoming episodes as well. Glad to have you here. Stick around for more. Dr. Stukas, super excited to have you on. Um... I know we wanted to focus on allergies mostly, but I, you know, I think our timing is pretty uh, unique since the FDA is meeting about, you know, the age is five to 11 right now. Uh, yes. I just want to get your, yeah, it's, it's a really good timing. So I thought, you know, who better to ask than the, you know, expert. Uh, oh, what are your thoughts great. on, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, kind of what the outcome might be of today's meeting? Uh, I have no reason to believe that they're going to, that, They'll have issues with it. Um, I haven't had a chance to look through all of the data they supply, but the snippets I, I read um, look pretty good. It's reassuring from a safety standpoint. Looks like it has very good efficacy, especially compared to the adult data. And I see no reason why they want to prove it. Yeah, I was thinking that they're going to lean that way also. Um, I did have some questions that they mentioned in the meeting that, uh, you know, sometimes they don't really answer, you know, point blank. They kind of circle around it a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. I thought I'd ask you. Um, so one of the questions was, is, you know, the, the age from 11 to 12, um, is it better to just wait from, you know, if you're 11 years old and you're about to turn 12 to wait till you're 12 to get that higher dose? You know, that's a great question. And it's our son uh, turns 12 on November um, 9th. So <laughs> you're right we're, in that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're probably going to wait. Uh, we, it's just. Yeah, there's, it's probably fine either way. There's nothing magical that happens when, you know, at the age of 12 compared to mm -hmm. 11. Um, but I, I think the higher dose is probably going to be a little bit more of an immune boosting effect for, for him. So yeah, I'd say go ahead and wait, but it depends okay. on where you live and it depends on the prevalence of COVID in your community. It depends on underlying risk factors and exposures and all kinds of other factors that sort of play into the decision of if and when to vaccinate kids. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the other question I had was, uh, one of the questions was, since the uh, vaccine would, from the five-year-old to 11-year-old range would be one-third, I believe, the dose of the normal uh, vaccine, um, does it also have the same impact uh, for your memory? Um, do you understand what that question is saying? I don't know if I phrased it the right way. <laughs> Yeah, right. So um, are kids going to have the same robust immune response if they're getting a smaller mm -hmm. dose? And the answer is, I mean, uh, judging, assuming that they demonstrate that with their data, then yes, we have every reason to believe that. We often use smaller doses in younger children, uh, partly because their immune system is just very robust and can respond to antigens a lot better than uh, somebody who's elderly, for instance. Awesome. So, uh, you know, since we got those few questions out of the way, um... That was more of your immunologist side, but you also wow. are an allergist. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of what you what you do as an allergist? Yeah, yeah. So as a as an allergist, you know, after um, medical school, I, I went into residency to become a pediatrician. So you spend three years doing that, and I learned all about the different conditions that affects kids and uh, normal development and things along those lines. And then I did two extra years of specialty training in an allergy and immunology fellowship. And during those two years, I learned um, all about the immune system. I learned how to speak a new language. I learned about the complexities surrounding the immune system, and then also how to diagnose and treat a wide variety of allergic conditions and immune deficiency disorders. And then I took my board certification exam. So when I say that I'm a board certified allergist immunologist, that means that I went through all of those extra steps uh, that says that I received specialty training and have, de and have um, demonstrated proficiency in treating patients with these conditions. And that's what other allergists and immunologists do as well. And now what I do in my daily life, well, now I really focus on kids with food allergies. Uh, but before that, I would see kids with some of the most common chronic conditions, uh, environmental allergies to things like cat and dog dander, tree pollen, uh, asthma, uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema, medication allergies, venom allergy, um, and uh, also would help evaluate children with concerns for underlying immune deficiency. So we cover a whole host of conditions. A lot of them have um, some similarities in regards to different pathways of inflammation or parts of the immune system that may or may not be involved. And unfortunately, there's a lot of children out there that sort of develop on this allergic pathway where they come out and during early infancy, they have uh, pretty persistent eczema. And then as they get older, their eczema may 
improve, but they may develop food allergies. And then when they're toddlers, they may develop environmental allergies, and then sometimes they'll have wheezing or asthma. So we often uh, will follow children uh, for, you know, 20 years until they graduate and go on to see an adult provider. Yeah, that actually leads to, you know, my next question is, uh, how different is the pediatric side of allergies compared to adults? Is there actually a change once they turn, you know, that magical number once they turn 18 and they're an adult? Is there really a big change? Yeah, it's nothing about the, the magical number necessarily, but um, mm -hmm. a lot of allergies tend to improve as uh, children get older and go through adolescence. Uh, we know that there's, you know, it sort of flips. Boys tend to be um, tend to outnumber the number of girls with allergies and various allergic conditions about three to one during early childhood. And that reverses during adolescence. There's probably some hormonal influences during puberty that we don't fully understand. But once you're, you're uh, into your late teens or you're an early adult, if you have uh, allergies or asthma, um, you've sort of declared yourself that it's likely going to be lifelong at that point. So whereas in pediatrics, oftentimes this gets better uh, with age, by the time you're an adult, unfortunately, that usually means you're going to, you know, it's going to be persistent throughout the rest of adulthood. Yeah, that, that leads to another thing that I was wondering about, because, um, you know, there's people that have different degrees of allergies. Is it genetic or is it environmental or is it a mix of everything? It is a mix. Uh, we know that there's a very strong genetic predisposition. So allergic parents tend to have children that inherit that, uh, that DNA that says, I'm likely going to develop allergies. But we also know that there are various early life exposures that tend to flip those switches on or off. Uh, so just because you have the blueprint in your DNA that says you're likely going to develop allergies, not everybody does. Uh, and others that, you know, not, it may not necessarily be inherited, but there may be either, you know, changes to their DNA that naturally occur as, mm -hmm. uh, as the body forms or maybe there are early life exposures that tend to sort of predispose them to, to develop allergies. So unfortunately, there's no easy answer and it's a pretty complex interaction. Yeah, you know, uh, talking about kind of the genetics uh, part of it with things like CRISPR, and I'm not sure like how much progress they've made in that kind of area, but with things like CRISPR, if there's a chance that it is genetic or that you can, you know, turn on or off those different uh, variables, can you actually potentially cure allergies where you can switch all the ones off that need to be off and you don't have any allergies. Yeah, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, I don't know if we're going to get there or when we'll get there because it's a little more complicated. Let's take asthma, for instance. I mean, there's, you know, over 30 different sort of what we call polymorphisms that have been identified or different mutations that would predispose or associated with somebody who has asthma. But, you know, asthma is not one size fits all. We know there's different types of asthma and there's different types of, of inflammation and different types of cells involved, uh, different patterns and prognosis and things like that. So uh, it, it's unfortunately not just not so easy is just it's one you know single part of the dna that needs to be altered or, or anything like that uh and uh i wish it were that simple yeah that would be nice especially for uh, people like me who suffer pretty bad from allergies so yeah. i'm sure there's a lot of empathetic people out there to that um you know some people don't really um probably don't really understand like what the allergies actually do like how does it actually work when you you know let's say you're mowing the yard and all of a sudden your eyes shut close and you're you know, sniffly, like what actually happens to cause that reaction? Yeah, when people develop allergies, it, it's it's an immune system response to some foreign antigen. And an antigen can really be any anything from tree pollen to cat dander to a peanut or ragweed or medication or things like that. And with allergies, it's reproducible. So every single time you're exposed to whatever that is, uh, your immune system says you don't belong here and you, you have a response. And the allergy antibody is called immunoglobulin E or IgE. And this antibody is attached to the allergy cells throughout the body and in the bloodstream. So when you are exposed that antigen, the IgE binds to it, unlocks the allergy cells, and they release all kinds of different chemicals. And the chemicals go to different parts of the body to cause symptoms. And histamine is one of the main chemicals that gets released almost immediately. And histamine makes people itch, it makes them sneeze, it can make you cough, it can get hives in the skin or flushing and skin rashes. Uh, it can really impact, uh, you know, uh, any type of uh, organ system throughout the body. Uh, but there's other chemicals as well that kind of get involved and can cause other symptoms. So really it's when we think about allergy, I, I want your listeners to think about uh, reproducible reactions caused by the immune system. And it really is a cause and effect. Uh, it should really, it should happen consistently with exposure. Yeah. And that's one of the things that you've talked about that I really thought was a good point um, as far as allergies versus and, uh, you know, intolerances. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so as we just discussed, an allergy is really an immune response against uh, a food. So when it comes to food allergies, every single time you eat the food, no matter what form, you should have rapid onset results or, or symptoms, I should say, with such as big red itchy hives, swelling, maybe vomiting. Whereas an intolerance does not involve the immune system, it's more difficult to eat digestion. Uh, so, you know, with a milk allergy, you really shouldn't be able to eat cheese or ice cream or yogurt because the milk protein is present in all of those. Whereas somebody with lactose intolerance um, can very likely eat lactose free dairy because lactose is a sugar found in dairy products. And uh, for those individuals, they just can't digest that sugar. So it passes through their intestinal tract and it causes discomfort because you get sort of, you know, fluids shifting into the bowels, which makes you crampy uh, and bloated and uh, not feel very well. Well. Awesome. Yeah, I think that'll help people clear up some of those misconceptions about maybe thinking that they're allergic to milk when it's really just more of a digestive issue. Um, I think right. there's some of the other kind of things. Yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think clarification is really important because if you're allergic, you really need to strictly avoid it. You're potentially at risk to have a more severe allergic reaction called anaphylaxis, need to have epinephrine available, uh, need to read labels, avoid, you know, small amounts, all that fun stuff. Whereas if it's more of an intolerance, that often can come and go over time that may resolve with age. You may be able to tolerate it in certain forms, but not others. Uh, and, and it just really has very different ramifications in regards to avoidance measures as well as risk with for future symptoms. Yeah, I know personally with my intolerance, it's anything that's holiday food, like a roast, a turkey, literally anything that's holiday food, I can't eat it. So always right. in the holidays, I'll, you know, take my own little snacks or just drink something. So uh, intolerances definitely can be, uh, you know, a little bit of annoyance, but uh, you did mention histamines. Now, one thing that a lot of people are familiar with are antihistamines. Um, mm -hmm. How does that help? Um, and why is it different for some people where... You know, if uh, my wife takes a uh, Benadryl, she'll be fine, but she'll be sleepy. But if I take one, uh, it really doesn't help my allergies. It just makes them sleepy. Yeah, you know, I think it, it, it's important to be thoughtful about why are we using these medications. So we, we've had these first generation antihistamines around like Benadryl for 80 years. Uh, and they're frankly, you know, Chris, they're outdated. They're, you know, these are such old products that they have very short half lives. Uh, they cause major side effects like drowsiness and um, uh, decrease, you know, reaction time if you're trying to operate a motor vehicle, things like that. But we have these newer second generation antihistamines that last a lot longer, work faster, have much less side effects. And they just, you know, they're, they're much better medications. And these would be things like, you know, trade names like Zyrtec or Allegra or Claritin, yeah. uh, things like that. So if we're treating symptoms due to histamine, then antihistamines may be helpful. I think where a lot of the hard part comes in here is that people often use these medications for a whole host of symptoms that have nothing to do with histamine. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you get a cold uh, or if you have a runny nose or congestion because you have a viral infection, people are, are advised to take any histamines. Well, that's not going to offer any benefit because that's not a histamine mediated condition. Condition. That's going to occur more with allergies and things like that. Or even if you do have seasonal allergies and you have severe nasal congestion, antihistamines aren't good for that. Antihistamines are really best suited for things like sneezing and itching. They're not going to help a whole lot when you have persistent nasal congestion and swelling inside the nose and post-nasal drip and things like that. That's where nasal steroid sprays come into play. So thinking about why are we using the medications that we use, what, uh, what's the origin of the actual symptoms that are occurring, uh, and do the medications, you know, are they actually indicated for use for whatever symptoms that you're using them for. But that, that's more often than not why people aren't responding to their you know, typical dose or the type of medication that they're using. Yeah, I think a lot of times people just go to the store and see, you know, a wide variety of allergy, you know, aisle medicine, and they think, well, this will help all of them. So I think you breaking down kind of the difference between the two uh, or different types uh, really might help some people when they're maybe needing a specific thing for a specific situation. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's, and, you it's know, super confusing. It really is. Because like you said, if you go to the pharmacy aisle and you look at the, the cough and cold and flu aisle yeah. or the allergy aisle, there's 20 different varieties for every type of pill or liquid or nose spray or eye drop. And uh, there's subtle differences, but there's very important differences in how they actually work inside the body. Yeah, I think whenever I was younger, the first time I noticed that all the medicine was kind of the same, but maybe a little bit different was whenever you had to choose between the regular cough or the cough medicine with DM, like that was, a, ah. that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. So I think that might be you know, some of the case with the allergy side of things too, um, especially the cold medicine. Those are pretty much all the same, but they have like a little word or two different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, on the opposite side of things, some people don't really like to take anything at all. They just kind of push through it, whether that's uh, because they want to be more natural or maybe they don't really understand like what it might do to them side effect wise. 
um, are there any natural options instead of medicine? And specifically, one of the things that always comes up is uh, go and, you know, get some local honey. Does that really help you? Yeah, so the honey one's easy. No, it does not. Uh, so, and here's the reason why: it, the the pollen that causes allergy symptoms is very small and windborne. It comes from plants such as trees and grasses and weeds and ragweed uh, and things like that. But the pollen that honeybees collect comes from non-windborne plants like flowers. So this pollen is much heavier and doesn't get up in the air, and it's a very rare cause of actual allergy symptoms. So not only does honey contain the different types of pollen that would actually cause allergy symptoms, but it's very inconsistent in regards to how much pollen is in honey and what types of pollen and things like that. And in fact, if somebody were allergic and they were eating their pollen that caused their symptoms, it wouldn't make them feel better. It would make them feel pretty awful because they're eating a mouthful of their allergen. Uh, so it's just a, a big mm -hmm. myth that uh, you know has been, uh, it's all marketing basically. And there's a lot of folks out there that you know will tout these unproven claims and sell their you know local organic honey to treat a whole ver a variety of different maladies and symptoms. And I, I always say, eat honey because you like the taste of it and because it tastes <laughs> good. Um, there is actually some evidence that shows if you have post nasal drip or a sore throat that uh, eating some honey can actually coat the back of your throat and maybe make that symptom feel a little bit better, but it's not an actual treatment of allergic rhinitis or it won't desensitize you to pollen allergies, unfortunately. Yeah, hopefully um, we didn't see listeners just now because I know there's a lot of honey fanatics out there. Yeah, and that's great. But, uh, you know, as with anything, and this goes into the whole natural treatment phenomenon, mm -hmm. most of the things that are, are touted to treat a whole variety of different medical um, ailments or symptoms really don't have any evidence to support that. Or the evidence that they do use is, you know, cherry pick data from, you know, yeah. from a, a Petri dish study or in lab rats or something like that. So I always recommend just being really thoughtful about why we're, why we're doing what we're doing. If there's concern about the medications that are prescribed, I always point to, you know, these medications undergo years of rigorous testing. And they have to, be, you know, demonstrate, you know, significant efficacy and safety profiles before the FDA even grants them authorization to be used. So they're proven treatments, whereas the whole supplement industry doesn't require FDA approval. They're, they don't require any evidence at all that they actually contain what they say they contain, let alone treat the symptoms that they that they tout them to treat. So, um, it, you know, it, it, I get the, I, the wish to sort of um, go all natural or avoid medications mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, but you also have to understand the regulatory process and what you're what you're getting in the supplements may not even be what you think you're getting or may not do what you what you want it to do but that being said there are some great treatments that anybody can do so when it comes to environmental allergies it really dries out and irritates the mucous membranes inside the nose and sinuses and airway so um, trying to refresh that with just a natural treatment like a, a nasal saline spray or sinus rinses can work wonders just to soothe those irritated nasal passageways it doesn't contain any medication and it's just a, a delivery system to kind of get it up inside the nose or sinuses to to help sort of flush out the mucus and and calm everything down drinking lots of water getting a good night's sleep on a consistent basis really goes a long way in and how people are impacted by their environmental allergies because when you have severe seasonal allergies i mean people are miserable for weeks to months on end and that can really interfere with your sleep and work performance and school attendance and uh we really want to focus on all the other holistic approaches to make sure that our overall all health is is well controlled so exercise lots of water trying to reduce the amount of caffeine we're drinking trying to reduce the amount of alcohol we're, we're taking in um and getting a good night's sleep yeah i think that's a good point that i don't think a lot of people really bring up is the just exercise drink water and sleep like those are the three i would feel like probably the most important things that you can do uh whether or not i you know do them every day <laughs> i can't say but uh, I think if I were to do those every day and if everybody kind of stuck to those three things, I don't think there'd be as many issues, uh, you know, maybe not allergies, but other things, you know, that might affect your health uh, yeah. and allergies. Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard. None of us can do all these things all the time. And that's why I, I kind of even um, struggle with, you know, terms like what diet do you follow or things like that. It's like, yeah. it's, I don't want to pigeonhole people into thinking that they have to be so rigorous in, in everything that they do, but I, you know, everything in moderation and just sort of a general approach to, are you, are you doing lots of, you know, beneficial things for your overall health, uh, like exercise and uh, mm -hmm. eating, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and overall healthy diet while minimizing potentially harmful things. I think that's a better way to sort of approach um, our, our journey through life. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, speaking about the, uh, you know, chemical versus natural route, um, I always try to remember that, even the natural side of things is made up of chemicals. I mean, we're all chemicals. So just because something is it, you know, quote unquote natural doesn't mean it's not something that we're already familiar with. It's just maybe in a different, uh, you know, way that it's made. 
Yes, exactly. Right. It's yeah. Everything has chemicals in it. I mean, that's just that's organic chemistry. That's the building blocks of life. Um, uh, so it you demonizing words such as chemicals or you know looking at things as all natural versus yeah. uh, synthetic. I think that really just kind of pigeonholes people into some distorted thought processes that can really decrease your quality of life because uh, you you start to think like oh my gosh I'm going to really hurt myself if I do this and you start to you you, you can very quickly uh, forget why 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 are you avoiding these in the first place and where did that information come from and is it actually vetted and valid and evidence based. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just one of the things that I think is always weird is how honey is made, how the bees actually make it. I won't mention it, but if you want to look it up, maybe I'll let the listeners go and look it up how it's made. Cause it's, I mean, if you listened uh, to how it was made, maybe you don't want to do that. And maybe you'll go down the cold and flu aisle and get you something else. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But um, uh, one of the things, especially this last, uh, I would say a couple of years now with the pandemic has been a confusion between, is it a cold? Is it uh, allergies or is it COVID? Is there really any easy way aside from going to get tested to know which one it is? Yeah, unfortunately, the only way to know for sure is to get a COVID test. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of overlap in these symptoms. We can tease things out uh, somewhat when it comes to allergies. So allergies won't cause a fever, even though sometimes they're referred to as hay fever. They don't actually mm -hmm. cause an increase in body temperature or fever. If you have allergies, they're pretty going to be more chronic. So seasonal allergies really should cause symptoms that last weeks to months. Whereas if you have a viral illness or COVID, it's really going to be acute onset and only last for a couple of weeks in general. Um, allergies tend to make people very itchy. Whereas if you have infection, it itches a much less you know, significant component of that. But otherwise, any of these conditions can cause nasal congestion, runny nose, sort of not feeling well overall. Um, allergies shouldn't cause any of the GI symptoms you may get when you have a viral infection, such as, you know, cramping or diarrhea or things like that. So you can tease them out a little bit, but there is a, a ton of overlap, unfortunately. And right now with the world we live in, the only way to know for sure is to have that COVID test that says whether you do or don't have it. Okay, I like that, uh, just to be safe. Um, you know, one of the things, and this might be one of those other kind of uh, myths, is if early exposure to different allergens help build a tolerance. And, and as an example, um, I live outside the main city, so it's more of a rural area. and We see a lot of farmers around. Um, I don't know if I've ever met a farmer that has allergies um, to the extent that we do, where we go into a you know dust field and all of a sudden we start sneezing. Uh, every farmer I've ever met pretty much seems like they're fine. Um, is there any truth to that? Yeah, so uh, the hygiene hypothesis has been shown for, for decades in various continents throughout the world that for children who grow up in sort of a more rural farming environment where they're exposed to a, a bunch of different, uh, you know, um, bacteria and, and germs, basically, they tend to have less allergies as they get older. In fact, if they're exposed to animals and more specifically the feces from animals, um, <laughs> that really exposes their, you know, their immune system very early on. So they don't they're less likely to develop allergies. Uh, we know that with food allergy, uh, we used to recommend avoidance of food allergens such as peanuts and milk and egg and infants. Um, but now we have outstanding evidence that shows if we can get uh, infants to start eating these foods in age appropriate forms and keep them in their diet from a very early age, starting around four to six months of age after they're eating other solids, that's our best path to preventing food allergies. So yes, exposure uh, does tend to you know, promote tolerance when it comes to the immune system. Awesome. Yeah, that's one of the worries I had as a, a new parent uh, whenever I first started having kids is, um, you know, are they allergic to something that I don't know about? And um, one of the strangest things that one of my sons was allergic to, uh, that happened by accident because, uh, you know, for kind of sum it up real quick, he wanted a Band-Aid because he thought he was hurting, but he really just wanted a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. uh, so we gave him a Band-Aid, he put it on his forehead. And the Band-Aid ended up having that uh, Neosporin type ointment on it, uh, you know, cut to later on in the day, we take the Band-Aid off and there's a square burn mark from whatever kind of reaction he had. Um, you know, so that was one of my fears and it, it came true in a weird way. It wasn't food. It wasn't, you know, peanuts or shrimp or anything like that, but it was a completely different thing that is supposed to help, you know, heal cuts and make you feel better. But it ended up leaving like uh, blister burns on his forehead um you know how how does that work 
Yeah, so um, there's a lot of reasons why symptoms like that can develop. Sometimes it's just due to non-specific irritation. So many children just have sensitive skin. So any type of adhesive, uh, anything with you know the preservatives or chemicals or you know scents or fragrances to it can potentially irritate the skin. So it's not a true allergic reaction per se, but they do get redness from and irritation from it. Uh, that tends to get better as kids get older. And then there are the more rare sort of delay type of allergy. So we talked before about that said allergic reaction caused by this IgE antibody. Well, you know, poison ivy causes allergy in about 95% of the population, but it's a very different type of allergy. So this is more of a delayed onset uh, allergy or contact dermatitis caused by T cells. Yeah. So you're exposed to the oils from it, you're fine, 24, 48 hours later, you get this blistering rash. Uh, so it's definitely an allergic response. It's gonna happen every time you're exposed to it, but that's very different than, you know, uh, causing anaphylaxis in somebody or sending them to the ER and eating epinephrine, that sort of thing. So it's a yeah. Possibility, like with your son, maybe there is this very rare delayed onset contact dermatitis to uh, whether it's neosporin or part of the adhesive or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely one of the more shocking things that happened as a parent. Because um, I mean, we plan for like all the other things that are common, but you know, to put on a band aid and pull it off and have a burn mark where there was no, you know, cut or anything, uh, that was pretty shocking. So I'm thankful that you kind of went over what, you know, might cause that. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're talking about. Uh, you know, uh, hygiene hypothesis, I think is how you said it, but is the over sanitization, especially during the COVID era, um, has that maybe led to potentially more allergies in the future for those, you know, newborns that uh, were raised during that time where you don't really go out, you don't really hang around any of the other uh, people. And there's like that over cleanliness, just trying to not get COVID. Yeah, you know, to, to tease out what's happening during the pandemic, it, it'll be t to be determined whether that's going to impact, you know, generations to come in regards to um, allergic diseases and things like that. But we do know uh, that infants who are raised in more sterile environments do have, are associated with increased risk to develop allergies as they get older. Uh, one of my favorite studies was, was in um, infants when they had pacifiers or binkies and, you know, all of our babies, their pacifier falls out of their mouth. So they randomized to two groups. One group of parents would put their binky in their mouth to clean it off and then plug it right back in their baby's mouth. And the other group washed it off or got a, got a fresh one. So those infants whose parents put their binky in their mouth and then gave it to them again uh, had less risk of developing eczema as they got older. Uh, so there's something to just being exposed to a bunch of different germs that don't cause sickness or infection, but yet it lets your immune system sort of practice. Um, and there's a misconception about babies and their immune system that people think that, you know, they're these, um, you know, ticking time bombs or they're very yeah. weak and they, they can't adjust to multiple vaccines at once or, or the world that we live in. That's not true. They have very robust immune systems. And in fact, they want to practice and they need to go to the gym and, and get really strong and learn how to recognize the, the trillions of bacteria that live on us and in us um, so they can recognize them and fight them off. And that way, when a, when a true pathogen or infection comes along, um, they're not more susceptible to that infection. So are we okay with the 10 second drop rule? Because my oh kids my are. <laughs> yeah, like 30 second drop rule. And like oh, step, okay. on, step on it with your shoe and put it in your mouth before you give it back. <laughs> yeah, I try to catch them sometimes. They're fast. I'm like, what did you just do? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that also leads me to another point. Um, you know, we're talking about germs and bacteria. Um, does a microbiome play any role in al allergies at all? Probably. Uh, that's the easy answer right now. So there's something mm -hmm. there where, um, you know, the different microbiota have been identified in children with allergies compared to those who don't have allergies and other types of conditions as well. But we're not nearly at the point where we can actually test for that and understand what it means, nor do anything about it. So anybody who says, oh, the microbiome is different in kids with allergies to take some probiotics. Well, you know, it's not that simple. Uh, one, there's different probiotics and prebiotics. There's different concentrations and strains and amounts that we would give. And two, we still don't have those studies that show if your microbiome has X, Y, and Z, that this is the probiotic that may reprogram that or reset things. Uh, so that's another example of sort of um, where people take it to the next level online and they tout all these different claims that really aren't supported by the evidence. So right now, the evidence, I think, supports that, yes, there's some signal there that there's something different about the microbiome in these, in these children and infants. The next step is going to be how can we accurately identify what those differences are and then what can we do about it to actually impact the development of allergic conditions? So that's to be determined. Yeah, it's really fascinating how many things are kind of still up in the air after so, you know, so long. But I think the big thing is, 
you know, technology doesn't develop as fast as studies can come out. So I think a lot of it just has to do with, you know, how much technology do you have to do these different types of studies, especially when we're talking about, you know, the microbiome and it's, uh, you know, maybe not as easy as just putting it on a Petri dish and, you know, looking in a microscope. Yeah, it's promising. There's a lot of great research in this area, but it's still the very early stages. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe you are quite the um, science enthusiast. So I thought I'd ask you, a uh, question that is maybe a little bit out there, um, but are there allergies in space? And, you know, two parts of that. First, in the International Space Station, where we obviously have people already, um, and we've had people there for a long enough time to kind of see what the long-term effects would be, especially in an environment where uh, presumably it's so sterile and also getting bombarded by radiation, at least more than on Earth. Um, and then the second part to that is, if we, you know, looking ahead, of course, if we do ever end up going to Mars, um, can we expect to have allergies on a different world the same way we have them here as far as uh, what might affect us or what might not? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Hey, everyone, it's Chris, the host of Is It Just Speculation? What if I told you that you can make your very own podcast for free and you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required? That's Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast, and that's what I use. It has all the tools that you need in one place so you can record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so you can work on go, or you can work at home in the comfort of your PJs. That's what I do sometimes. Don't tell nobody, though. Anchor also distributes your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more places all around the world within a matter of moments. That's the beauty of Anchor. It really lets you have a message and get it out there. You have your own voice, guys. It's everything that you need to make a podcast in one convenient place. Please download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. You're missing out if you don't. So yes, um, there, there are actually studies have shown that you can measure uh, cat and dog dander in space, uh, <laughs> even when the animals aren't present. So this the dander is sort of everywhere yeah. in our environment. There, you can go on public buses and movie theaters and you know restaurants, and there's dander everywhere. So anybody who owns a pet, you have their dander on you. It's not the hair that causes allergies, but it's the dander that comes from saliva, skin cells, and urine. And it's microscopic, and it kind of gets everywhere. If you have a let's say you have a, a cat or a dog in your home, the dander gets inside the microfibers and the carpeting and upholstered furniture and the ductwork. Once you take that pet out of the home, it can take up to six months before that dander sort of uh, gets cycled through and is no longer present. So they've measured that in space. Now that's very different than pollen or outdoor uh, derived um, mm -hmm. uh, allergens from plants. So I have no reason to believe that you're going to find that in space, uh, nor if we were to um, inhabit Mars, unless they find some way to actually uh, grow some pollinating plants and mm -hmm. uh, specifically plants that are windborne pollinators, which given the atmospheric conditions on Mars and other planets, I doubt that's going to be a possibility. Now, Venus uh, would probably be horrific for those who have environmental <laughs> allergies. Well, one, you'd burn up upon entry, but two, with the greenhouse effect, I, I suspect that there are tons of, of flora and the pollen counts on Venus are probably astronomical, but that's just uh, my guess. I don't think anybody's actually done that study yet. <laughs> we'll put that on the uh, to be determined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, glad you looked at that. I, I would not have thought that there would be those kind of allergens in the space station, especially because how careful they are to not, you know, if they're going to a different planet, they take so many precautions to not contaminate it with our life because uh, they don't want to discover life and, you know, end up seeing that it was actually from us. So that's pretty shocking that it even makes it to the space station of all places. Yeah, well, it's not alive. I mean, these are just, you know, it's it's an inert part of our environment, but I think it really speaks to the sticky, um, ubiquitous nature of the, this different dander. So I'm sure somebody who owns a pet was working on these uh, the space <laughs> shuttle and, or whatever, and that's how it, it hitched a ride. <laughs> I mean, there's some real big pet lovers. I wouldn't be surprised if astronaut snuck a cat up there. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a cat up there. Um, I did want to ask you about allergy tests. Um in general, because there's a lot of different companies in different places that you can do, you know, quick allergy tests. And uh, from what I've understood, there's some of them that are real sketchy where they don't actually show you anything. Um, and then there's other ones that are a little bit more accurate that can pinpoint exactly what's causing the allergy to occur. Um, what are your thoughts on allergy tests in general? 
I think you have to understand what you're getting. So all the stuff that you find on your pharmacy shelves for like food sensitivity tests and things like that, those are not validated or accurate and those aren't diagnostic for anything. And what they do is they measure something called IgG, which is very different than what we talked about before. IgE is the allergy antibody. So IgG is a memory antibody that is naturally produced when we're exposed to things. So if you eat a bunch of foods, your body should produce IgG. It means that you're tolerant of that food. So all these blood tests that you know are marketed for $200 or more, um, they actually don't diagnose anything. Um, but when it comes to IgE testing, uh, these still aren't all, all, also aren't very reliable. Uh, we have skin testing in the office. We have blood testing. We can measure levels of IgE. We get lots of false positives uh, because of cross-reactivity with different types of allergens, uh, non-specific elevations for a variety of reasons. So just because you have an IgE test done, that's not a yes-no test. It doesn't mean that you definitely have allergies. We always have to go back to the best test, which is the history. And the history is what happens when you're exposed. Are you having symptoms consistent with allergies? Are they reproducible with every exposure? And then we should consider whether or not IgE skin or blood testing should be performed. And if, if so, um, how are we going to interpret the results? Yeah. So, I mean, really the move would be to just go to somebody like yourself who actually has the tools to diagnose and really do the, the right kind of test. Because, I mean, $200 test and you're not really getting for, you know, what you paid for, that's that's pretty surprising. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring it up because I know a lot of people do, especially online, there's a lot of those quick, you know, uh, act now and get a quick test. Uh, but it's really not, I guess, as accurate as it should be, especially if you have really severe allergies and you're expecting this to kind of show you the, you know, the true extent of it. Uh, you might miss something on there. So I, I appreciate you kind of, you know, clearing that up a little bit. Um, with allergy testing, I know there's been some concern about uh, PEG or let me try to not butcher this polyethylene glycol um, in the vaccine. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what goes into testing ahead of time for those people that are concerned? Well, yeah. So when the COVID vaccines were first deployed for public use back in December of 2020, within the first week in the United Kingdom, they had two reports of anaphylaxis to the vaccines, which is interesting because there were no reports of anaphylaxis in the clinical trials with over 80,000 participants. Oh, wow. So the you know this obviously caused a lot of concern. Um, now it's important to to note that there are no food allergens in any of the vaccines. There's no environmental allergens, venom allergens, medication, you know, antibiotic allergens, things like that. So when they looked at the components of the vaccines, they said, what on earth could be causing these allergic reactions? And that people honed in on two specific chemicals. One is called polyethylene glycol, and the other is called polysorbate. And these have been reported to be a cause of extremely, extremely rare allergies in individuals, um, like case report level. Uh, these are present in many of the foods and medications that we use on a regular basis, uh, and they don't cause any problems. So uh, the FDA and the CDC came out and said, well, maybe this is the cause. And for anybody who has a confirmed uh, PEG or polysorbate allergy, don't get these vaccines that contain them. And those would be very rare individuals. Well, you know, after it's been 10 months and now with extensive experience in vaccinating, uh, you know, over a billion people, um, you know, hundreds of millions of people in the United States. Um, and we're seeing that rates of anaphylaxis are extremely rare, like about four in a million. Uh, and even those that occur, it's not the PEG or polysorbate. There's been extensive uh, studies done in looking at skin testing these individuals to see if they can detect allergy antibody towards these. Uh, the vast majority of people who have had a suspected allergic reaction to the first dose of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine can just get the second dose without having any problems at all. So there's a lot that we need to figure out from a mechanistic standpoint as to what's really going on here. Is it truly an allergic reaction, anaphylaxis? what's the cause of it. Um, but my advice would be right now, if you do, if you are a rare individual who uh, have had have a confirmed PEG or polysorbate allergy, and the only way you'd know that is because you had a prior reaction before the COVID vaccines to some other medication, and a board certified allergist uh, performed extensive skin testing to determine and they told you to your face, you are allergic to PEG or polysorbate. That's the only okay. way you would know it. Uh, so for the rest of the individuals out there, the millions of people with food allergies, environmental allergies, antibiotic allergies, latex allergy, these vaccines are completely safe for them. And uh, some people might wonder, what are those things and why are they in the vaccine? Um, are those just stabilizers to help kind of uh, increase the lifespan of the vaccine or do they do something completely different? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So every vaccine has some sort, you know, you're, you're producing millions of doses of vaccine. So it has to be stable for shipment. And, you know, you have to ha be stable once you thaw it out. And we don't want things to decompose. Um, so there's a couple of different ingredients in every vaccine that are designed to uh, do just that. They stabilize it. Um, sometimes we they add things called adjuvants, which enhance the immunogenicity of different vaccines as well. Uh, but yeah, you're going to see a list of anywhere from five to eight to ten ingredients on every vaccine that you get, and that's why they that's why they use these things. Okay, so I mean, for the average person, unless they specifically have been told that they have an allergic reaction to PEG or something like that, then uh, there's really no no need to get tested for it. Um, ahead of time for getting the vaccine. Is that kind of what we're going with? Yeah, there's really no need to okay. test ahead of time for any of these. And now we have options available. So even if you are worried about this, um, get the, you know, get the alternate vaccine that doesn't have that ingredient in it. Okay. Um, and, you know, while we're on the topic of kind of the COVID area, um, I've seen you talk a little bit about virus shedding and some other uh, immunologists kind of mentioned it. Um, that's something that's recently come up as far as, you know, things that I've seen. What is virus shedding and why is it not a worry with this vaccine? Yeah, the vast majority of vaccines we get are um, inactivated. So all the COVID vaccines, they don't have any live COVID virus in there. It's, uh, they don't cause people to actually replicate COVID inside their body. They don't cause infection and they can't make you sick with it. Uh, they do have side effects as most vaccines do as, as part of our normal immune response. Uh, you can get fever, muscle aches, and some redness and soreness at the site. Uh, those are the most common side effects. That's just our immune system saying you're a foreign antigen and you don't belong here. And you know, I'm, I'm boosting up my response to you. Um, so for inactivated vaccines, like all of the COVID vaccines, it is impossible uh, for the virus to replicate in the body, which is very different than if you actually get COVID infection in real life. That's what it does. That's why COVID exists. It needs hosts and it replicates inside our bodies and we spread it to other people and then it goes on existing. That's that's the only reason viruses exist is to find a host and, and replicate and get passed on. There are some vaccines that do use live viruses. However, they, ina they are inactivated so they don't cause illness, but they do have the potential that the virus can then replicate inside the body to a very low degree and they can potentially be shed or spread to others. So for live virus vaccines, uh, the intranasal flu vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, and uh, you know rotavirus, and um, a couple of others, uh, we want to be careful if those individuals live inside a, a home or work closely or near anybody who has a compromised immune system, because it could potentially pass it on to them and make them sick uh, for just a brief period of time. Uh, but that's very different than the COVID vaccines. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard you talk about before and other people talk about before is like, I think there's nine main food allergies. Um, is that the right number or is there, I mean, do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's there's like nine foods that account for more than 90% of all food allergies. That okay. would be, you know, milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and sesame. You have that down. I, sp I struggled with the question itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, with those many uh you know, 90% 90, 90 within just nine, I guess, food types. Um, has there ever been a real argument to just eliminate those foods from, you know, altogether? Um, or would that, that actually do more harm to not expose anybody to them? And then maybe the allergy kind of builds up uh, to get worse. Right. So if you're not allergic yet, and the only way you know you're allergic is what happens when you eat it, um, we recommend yeah. introducing all these foods and, and eating them on a consistent basis. That's how you promote tolerance. Um, and then if somebody does develop a food allergy to, to one of those foods, we don't want to have them avoid all the foods. We want to clarify the diagnosis and, and tell them exactly what they need to avoid and why. And then unfortunately, they do, they do need to avoid that specific food. Uh, but if we go by testing alone, we're going to overdiagnose the vast majority of people because of all the false positives that we get. Uh, so we really want to promote early introduction and keeping it in the diet. And then if somebody does have a suspected allergy, we need to clarify exactly what are you allergic to and what you need to avoid and why. But we don't want to make just blank statements that you know a certain segment of the population yeah. needs to avoid all these foods all right um you know one question i did have was about pregnancy and um, allergies uh, specifically for my wife who is pregnant right now she oh, used to be able oh thank you i appreciate that um i i joke about it but it's true the only thing we caught during the pandemic was baby fever <laughs> this is our uh -huh. second baby <laughs> so wow yeah during the pandemic so uh, it's been interesting um, and that's one of those, you know, things that led me to ask about, you know, are we creating, you know, too safe of an environment as far as exposure to different things? Because, uh, I mean, it really does affect a lot of people because 
uh, there's a lot of people that have had babies in the last couple of years. And I think a lot of them maybe wonder, you know, what does this do to my kid, uh, you know, long-term. So I think that's one of those kind of important points to look at, especially for parents. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, I think first and foremost, you know, with masks, there's so much misinformation surrounding that wearing a mask when you're out and about or near others, isn't going to affect your immune system. Our immune yeah. systems are challenged by microbes in our environment all day, every day. And they do a really good job at sort of protecting us and practicing and fighting them off. So I don't, I wouldn't be concerned about that. Um, and to be honest, there's not a whole lot that you can do to cause problems in your baby, <laughs> yeah. which, which means that, you know, there's not a whole lot that you can do that would protect it. Um, if anything's going to happen, it's already been done when uh, your DNA combined with her DNA. Um, so whatever's happening now. Uh, but, you know, we know like maternal diet during pregnancy does not cause food allergies. So pregnant women can eat whatever they want. Same with those who are breastfeeding. It's not going to make their baby develop a food allergy and avoidance won't prevent it either. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding that. But I, in general, I tell, you know, this is my pediatrician hat. I tell mm -hmm. parents like there's going to be so much to worry about in your child's life. Let's do our best to really worry about those things. The one that you can control and two that actually pose real risk as opposed to all the what if scenarios that you'll never be able to answer. Yeah. And, you know, to the mask point, I think Halloween coming up, I think a lot of people never had a problem with the mask for the whole day, <laughs> let alone just a trip, a trip to the grocery store. So um, maybe some people will kind of second guess their mask opinion just based on what they wear for Halloween. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah, that's a whole other topic, but it, it's yeah, those are right. less breathable for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but yeah, my wife, she actually had no issues with orange juice, uh, specifically with pulp before she was pregnant. Um, and then recently she tried to have some orange juice on two or three different occasions just to make sure she actually was having an issue with it. Um, but she would get hives and uh, get itchy and her throat would feel like it's closing up. But it, I mean, um, you know, how does something like that happen? Does pregnancy actually change what somebody might be allergic to? Well, that's really interesting and unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yes, uh, during pregnancy, a, a woman's body undergoes drastic and dramatic changes to all kinds of different physiological elements and uh, their blood volume increases, their pulmonary function decreases, all kinds of stuff changes. But we know with asthma, for instance, about a third of women who um, when who have asthma and then become pregnant, their yeah. asthma can significantly worsen during pregnancy. Um, and for reasons we don't fully understand, it's probably partly the hormones that are rapidly changing as well the physiology same thing with environmental allergies so yes there is there are some changes that occur during pregnancy some of them go back to baseline after the baby's delivered uh, which is really fascinating but sometimes they do become more persistent as well yeah i will say my wife had cravings that were strong enough that she knew she would probably get the reaction again and she was like i'm drinking my orange juice <laughs> so <laughs> she uh, still went for it oh, um, my. yeah but uh, i mean you can't fight pregnancy cravings <laughs> Um, so, you know, as a fan of science, uh, has climate change impacted allergy frequency or severity, especially, you know, global, uh, globally? Yes. Um, the, the easy answer is yes. It's unfortunate. But there's outstanding evidence that has demonstrated a couple of effects. One is the um, the pollen season is longer. So as climates have changed throughout the world, uh, we are seeing, say, trees start to pollinate earlier and then the pollen season lasts longer. So they're longer in duration. Number two, the levels of pollen in the air are higher. Uh, because of the climate changes as well. And number three, we're seeing new allergies develop in, in areas where certain plants were, no, were no, not previously growing. Uh, so, you know, ragweed wasn't present in Europe 20 years ago, and now they have ragweed allergy in Europe. Uh, so the climate is changing, and it's absolutely impacting those who have um, environmental allergies and pollen allergies. Now, uh, one of the things that people do to combat different allergy uh, reactions in different levels, but is uh, they buy hypoallergenic materials. Um, can you talk a little, about, a little bit about that and maybe how they might work or not work? I think it depends on what you're allergic to. So uh, it, the diagnosis is so important in order to help understand mm. the different mitigation strategies and avoidance measures that may or may not be helpful. So for those with dust mite allergy, for example, uh, dust mites live, they like to eat our dead skin cells. So they tend to congregate inside 
where we sleep. So pillows and mattresses. So we can get zippered proof dust mite encasements that go around all of our pillows and mattress. And then we wash our linens in hot water that can really reduce the dust mite burden. Whereas if you use like a humidifier, they love moisture. So the humidifiers can help dust mites proliferate. Uh, there is no such thing as a hypoallergenic cat or dog. Uh, these are these are marketing terms, but every cat or dog will produce dander of some form. Now there are a lot of people out there that have cat or dog allergies that are fine around certain breeds, but they have symptoms around others. It's not because those breeds are hypoallergenic; it's just because that person may be allergic to a, certain, a specific type of dander uh, that that breed has, or that breed produces in, in higher quantities, or, or things like that. Um, so it really goes back to start with the diagnosis and what you're trying to avoid and why, and then uh, then talk to a, hopefully a board certified allergist before you spend hundreds of dollars on these things. Yeah, I like that. Um, this might be another one of those out there questions, but I think you might like it. Um, do other apes have allergies as far as like orangutans or grows or anything like that? Um, or is it just humans? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't, I just don't know. That's a great question. Dr. Dave, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, please tell me. Oh man. Um, yeah, I was asking my wife, she says yes. Um, and I asked her, where do you see, where do you see all these apes that you know the answer? <laughs> so uh, she said, apparently at a zoo, she's, she's seen um, apes that are sneezing. So that's her antidote. <laughs> well, so, I, um, I would, I would politely offer to your wonderful wife that there are a variety of reasons why any animal yes. sneeze that have nothing to do with allergies, such as, uh, you know, if apes live in an enclosure where it's very dusty or there's small particulates, that sneezing is a reflex that helps protect our passageways from these small particles. Um, so I would immediately counter with that. And I would say, I don't think that's proof of anything. <laughs> I'm on your team, doctor. <laughs> I'm on your team. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it. Um, and I was thinking, you know, the, the common one is dogs. Everybody thinks, oh, my dog's allergic because he sneezes. But they forget that the dog has a much more powerful nose, which if you smell pepper, me and you are probably going to sneeze. But if a dog smells pepper, of course, they're going to sneeze. Like their, their smell is so much more strong than ours that it'd be crazy for them to not be affected by it. So I kind of applied that to the, you know, other apes and uh, say maybe they don't have allergies as bad as us because uh, I've never seen it happen um, and they live out in the wild so <laughs> it would be pretty crazy for you know a monkey to be sneezing up in the trees trying to hide from a predator <laughs> Right. No, that's a good point. Now, I, I can tell you that dogs and, and other animals certainly can develop environmental allergies and sometimes mm. even get placed on allergy shots and immunotherapy and things like that. But uh, the ape question is a, is a good one. I don't know. I like that. Um, anytime we can stump the expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, things like CRISPR, but is there any other new work that's being done to either prevent, treat, or eliminate allergies? Because we've talked about uh, both that and things like Benadryl that's out of date. Is there anything that's on the horizon that might be um, interesting? Because I've always joked about it to my wife, but I, I told her if I ever started a company, it'd be something to help with allergies and it would be called um, Allergize and it'd be eye drop. <laughs> Is there anything out there like that? Yes. So uh, there's a, a new class of medications called biologics that we've been using for about 15 years. And what biologics do, are they target very specific parts of the immune system and they block that pathway. Um, so when it comes to allergic inflammation, for instance, there are certain inflammatory cytokines and mediators that are more involved. So if you can block those receptors or block the production of those, um, then for specific conditions like allergic asthma or uh, atopic dermatitis associated with allergies, or uh, you know conditions associated with increased levels of cells called eosinophils. These biologics have been shown that they can be very effective, whereas these patients would previously suffer from severe symptoms uh, that medications couldn't help with. And the biologics are unique because they're so targeted that oftentimes we can minimize side effects because they they really affect very specific pathways, which is very different than say prednisone. And prednisone and steroids are anti-inflammatory. Uh, treatment options, but they are very non-specific. So they just they have a whole host of side effects associated with them because they just sort of are big sledgehammers that go in and, and knock everything out. Uh, and whereas you know prednisone may put out the fire biologics prevent the match from being lit in the first place. Uh, so that's what we're using right now and they're being explored for a whole host of allergic conditions uh, for future use as well. That's great. Um, you know one of my follow-up questions to that is, if there's an active blocking of specific parts of the immune system, is there any um, risk in blocking parts of the immune system? Because it is a system that works together in some way. Um, is there any risk to that? 
Yes, uh, hopefully it's minimal, um, but you know everything we do has potential for side effects. But it's interesting that this IgE antibody we've talked about a bit today, uh, originally humans developed this to fight off parasitic infections. And as we went to more cleaner environments, you know, very few of us are exposed to parasites in first world countries now. It's still a major issue in third world countries. Uh, but if you're taking these biologic medications that block the allergic response, that could increase the risk of those individuals to develop parasitic infections. Now, of course, you'd have to be exposed to parasites. And so, you know, don't drink the water out of a lake when you're camping and be mm -hmm. careful if you're visiting third world countries and so on and so forth. But that's one potential um, downside to them that we always talk about. Now, I did want to talk about one of the most rare allergy or allergic reactions that I have ever heard of. And it's always stuck with me since I was a kid. Um, how does somebody become allergic to water? And I know it's super rare, but how does it happen, um, especially over a long evolutionary period? Like, how does that not get phased out? Yeah, you know, the, these are the media grabbing headlines mm -hmm. that we see. And we're talking about, you know, a handful of people in the history of, of mankind that may potentially have this allergy. Um, I suspect that a lot of these individuals have been misdiagnosed. And, you know, for instance, we have a lot of patients that have chronic non-allergic hives. So it's the same cells involved in allergic reaction. It looks like allergy and they just get hives all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's very easy to extrapolate that out and apply, you know, causality where it's actually correlation or coincidence. And they often get misdiagnosed so people are told that they're allergic to mold or you know uh, artificial food colorings preservatives or water or stuff like that so i i suspect that you know to be honest with you a lot of these individuals it may not be true water allergy we have water inside our bodies uh you know um it's probably not the case but for those rare individuals that it may be the case i don't know if we have a good understanding of why that may be um but yeah, it's funny how it's always stuck with you, right? Because it's these yeah. very attention-grabbing yeah. headlines out there. Uh, but then yeah. you really get to the root of the matter, and uh, sometimes it's not always what it seems to be. Yeah, and I think if I had to put a, a cause to it, I think um, water contaminants might be the, the main culprit. Um, right, or maybe there's something else that is water-based, and there's some mm -hmm. other you know, ingredient or, or um, allergen present. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, jumped on that real fast because I, I mean, I can kick that out of my head now and make some more space for another phone number or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I joke about it, but you know, my wife, she'll tell me something and I'm like, I have enough numbers in my head. I cannot remember that. Just text it to me. <laughs> so um, yeah, it'll, it'll make some room for something else. I'm sure. Um, I'm glad that we've talked about some common misconceptions. Um, are there any that maybe we haven't talked about that you hear day in and day out that you just want to you know, drive home that these are not real? Uh, the flu shot does not cause the flu. It's an inactivated vaccine. People often feel yucky afterwards because mm -hmm. either they're getting the flu shot in the middle of flu season when there's a bunch of other viruses that cause similar looking illnesses or they just have normal side effects to the flu vaccine like achiness and maybe low grade fever as their immune system ramps up the response. Uh, there's a, a huge misconception in the medical field that those people with a shellfish allergy can't receive contrast media. That was completely made up decades ago, and there's zero basis to it whatsoever. And yet uh, people still get asked whether they have shellfish allergy before they get a CT scan, but that's not even necessary in the first place. Uh, red dye is a very rare cause of allergy. Uh, if at all, uh, the artificial dyes are, are so small that they literally can't bind or unlock the IgE antibody. So when you look at the peer-reviewed medical literature, there's really no evidence to support this. But if you do a, a Google search, you're going to find 2 million websites to tell you why you may have a hidden red dye allergy. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are some of the more, more common ones that I hear. All right. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that I've seen on different websites all the time. It pops up and said, have you taken red number four or something like that. <laughs> like, I don't know, have I? Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you can kind of put that to bed and, you know, maybe it's not as big a concern and, you know, more of that sensationalized type of headline just to kind of get some eyes on it. Um, I did want to ask one more question about uh, kids in the vaccine. Um, one of the biggest criticisms is that kids, even though they can catch COVID and that they can spread COVID, they're individual rate of having, you know, real serious reactions to it is so low that they shouldn't get vaccinated um, as opposed to, you know, potential side effects. Uh, both cases are super rare, but what would be the main reason that you might say um, that it's worth getting your kids vaccinated, you know, in that five to 11 age group, uh, if it is approved? 
Yeah, you know, Chris, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think it's a valid discussion, but you know, the, the question in my mind isn't should I get the vaccine or not, or is the vaccine risky or not. The question is always for all of us: What's the risk of me getting COVID infection versus me getting the vaccine? That's the discussion here. Uh, with you know, COVID, it's going to be endemic more than likely. We're all likely going to get exposed at some point. And you're right. In most kids, they don't develop severe illness, uh, and um, you know they get over it very you know relatively easily. But there are kids who have died from it. There are children who develop long COVID and have chronic um, you know detriments to their health that are really suffering from this. There are those that can spread it to susceptible adults. Uh, so if we have a, a vaccine that we know is highly effective and also very safe. The question really is, what's the risk of infection versus the vaccine? So if you say, you know, you're worried about, say, myocarditis from the vaccine, yeah, it's a legitimate concern, but people get myocarditis from COVID infection as well at rates yeah. 10 times higher than that would get what they get from the vaccine. So this decision doesn't exist in a bubble. Um, it, it really isn't just, oh, I don't know about the vaccine. It, it's not, is it safe or is it, is it helpful or things like that? It's always what happens if I actually get infection. So if people out there that would argue, oh, kids are fine from the infection, you can make the same argument. Kids are fine from the vaccine as well as they're, as they're talking about in the FDA today. Uh, it's yeah. very safe to administer. So I think that's the conversation people need to have. Yeah, and I will point out for some of my listeners that maybe haven't heard my previous episode, I did talk to Dr. Azgadir. I'm not sure if, you, if you're familiar with her, but she's an immunologist. And uh, we covered a lot of the topics around COVID, and I think that cleared up a lot of it uh, for me and other viewers that maybe has some uh, reservations about the different parts that maybe weren't being talked about as much, you know, in media. Um, so I think, you know, for those listeners that are still curious about more of the COVID side of things, uh, you know, go back and listen to that episode with uh, Dr. Gadir. Um, as far as this episode, um, Dr. Dave, I am very happy that you were able to join and talk about, you know, all these different things. Um, you, by all accounts, are one of the most respected people in your field. And, you know, what I was, I was uh, talking to somebody about uh, you being on and they're familiar with your work and they were able to say, and, and I quote that you are a phenomenal allergist and this is somebody I respect. So I was like, oh, it's going to be good. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate you being on. And, um, you know, I look forward to maybe some future conversations. Maybe we can go back and look at the apes. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm flattered. And that, that's very kind of you to say. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to reach your listeners and talk with you. And um, I enjoyed our conversation. There's a lot to cover magnificent job of doing with your mm -hmm. questions and i like the questions about outer space you got me thinking there um i would like to do some experiments on venus now so maybe we can follow up with that in the future i'll <laughs> book a fight with elon <laughs> all right well uh, thank you for your time and i hope you have a great day all right you as well thank you bye I just wanted to thank everybody for listening and hope you enjoyed the episode. We have a few more guests lined up uh, coming up, so just stay tuned. Make sure you follow uh, on Spotify, Apple. Give a rating if you want. doesn't have to be five, but don't make it a one. And, uh, of course, if you want to check out my Instagram where I usually post some things about my guests uh, afterwards and uh, sometimes a little bit ahead of time just to kind of give people hints what might be coming, uh, that's going to be Instagram.com slash Chris Garcia, the real one. Not the fake one, the real one. So again, that's Chris Garcia, the real one on Instagram. Uh, if you don't know how to look up the podcast with my links, or if you maybe haven't seen the links, you can go to any place where you get podcasts at. Um, Spotify, Apple is probably the go-to. Um, if you go there, you can just type in, is it just speculation? If you still don't know how to find it, go to Google, type in, is it just speculation podcast? Uh, if you want to be real specific, is it just speculation podcast, Chris Garcia. So uh, it's there. It's on the web, on the interweb, on the internet, whatever you want to call it. Just go and search it.